Right, well, there it goes. Good evening. Welcome back to the Not So Perfect Bigfoot Show. Tonight I have William Robinson the Third, MD. He is from Alabama. I actually caught him in the chat. Um, I think it was Mark and Rebecca's chat, and um, you went to their meet and greet that they had. Correct. That's right. And, uh, I kind of plucked them out <laughs> and I said, you know what? I, I said, I think he would be a great person to interview. And because I always slaughter introductions, we were talking a little bit before we started. You have a very interesting past. Would you like to um, give everybody a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I did, in fact, grow up in Memphis, Tennessee and was there through the time I was 26 years old. I went to medical school at UT, University of Tennessee in Memphis, then to New Orleans, where I did residency at Tulane Medical School and the old charity hospital in New Orleans. Uh, went to University of Southern California for fellowship, then back to Tulane. I spent most of the uh, my career in New Orleans on and off. Um, and just recently retired from that last year, retired from uh, medicine and have we have a home, bought a home in Orange Beach, Alabama, which is where I am right now. But we've kept a home in New Orleans as well. So we go back and forth between the two. That's an absolutely that's just a lot to take in. You weren't hard for that. And I mean, that's very impressive. Now, when you were practicing in your field did you ever tell people about your encounter with bigfoot you know very rarely you know I, I in fact i would just say no um and that was for a variety of reasons number one i think physicians in general particularly i think cancer physicians who are dealing with patients who who have very serious illnesses that they may not recover from you have to maintain some kind of personal distance from them. You know, I mean, you want to be empathic, but at the same time, if if you're too much so, then your own mental health is threatened. So therefore, we typically, we as in doctors in oncology, typically try to maintain some personal different distance. So as a result, we don't let on too much about ourselves. We try to, you know, be friendly, be respectful, all of those things. But at the same time, we're not their best buddy. And, and preservation. And, right, right. For that part of and because they also have to have confidence in you. So you don't want to um, admit things that may be controversial. Like I wouldn't have told a patient that, you know, I did PCP in the past or something like that. Um, same thing with Bigfoot, even though I'm not ashamed of it period, or generally, um, you know, how some people react poorly to that. So I just, um, you know, specifically did not bring it up. Okay. And I, I take that that was with your coworkers too. Correct. I asked you a question before we got started and you said you didn't mind touching on the subject. And I think that's because you really do care about people and their health. And I asked you how much of the American diet had to do with cancer. And you gave me a pretty good um, answer. Could you uh, go into that for a minute? Because I, I think your background and what you are is as important as your, your, your Bigfoot sighting. So I'd like to go into that in a few moments, if you don't mind. Sure, that's fine. You know, I, there are a lot of people talking about diet these days and the additives and so forth. And there's not a lot of objective proof of that. But what we do have proof of is that diet is related to cancer in the sense that the rate of obesity in the U.S. is has grown astronomically. And we know for sure, no, no doubt about it, that obesity is associated with several different kinds of cancers. In fact, you can look at the kinds of cancers that are associated with obesity, like colon cancer, uterine cancer, and a few others. And they all have risen in incidence over the last 20 years or so. So there's no doubt that in that sense, diet is associated with cancer. If you consume more calories than you're burning off, um, your uh, risk of cancer is increased over the general population. As, as you know, Americans with our uh, processed foods and stuff, what's the best advice you can give older people like me? I'm, I mean, I'm 53 that 
that um, we're getting into our prime years, what's the best thing we can do to have a healthy life? You know, if, by far, the most important is don't smoke tobacco. I mean, that that is the single most important risk factor for cancer that you, it can be changed. You know, you can't do much about your parentage, and a lot of cancer is hereditary, but you can not use tobacco. That That's the most important one, or the, the in a sense, the easiest one to change. Uh, as far as diet goes, in general, I would tell people to avoid processed foods and use more fresh foods as much as they can. Do your own cooking rather than eating something that's been frozen and put in the, you know, the, the grocery freezer. Um, and in general, that will help. And also that will probably help you maintain your weight better uh, as you get older. And then if you just eat processed foods all the time and don't have to put the work into it of actually, you know, creating a, a, a dish in the kitchen. Uh, so I, I think that's, it's generally what I would say to somebody entering their fifties. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you why I'm a chunky monkey doc. I really am. So as you, um, your sighting was back in the eighties, correct? That's correct. 1980. Can you give us the location and kind of what was going on that day? Sure. So it was, in fact, the summer of 1980. I think it was June. And I was a college student at the time. We were all for the summer. That summer, I was working uh, as a lifeguard at a kind of a resort lake in Arkansas. I was still in Memphis at the time. Um, and this lake was just across the Mississippi River from Memphis. So I could commute over there, basically. Anyway, so we would alert myself and a buddy of mine from college were working there as lifeguards for the summer. And after the uh, lake closed down to swimmers every day, he and I typically would take a boat out and go fishing in this lake. Um, and we were doing that one day, like I said, in June. Uh, so it was still daylight, even though it was like 7 p.m. or something like that. Um, and we were uh, trolling, as they call it, you know, a trolling motor, a quiet electric motor going slowly kind of parallel to the shore, maybe 10 yards or so uh, offshore. And on the shore was very thick vegetation. This is, like I said, in the Mississippi Delta, so it's everything grows real fast. So the undergrowth is very heavy. Uh, we're slowly drifting or trolling down. And all of a sudden we hear like some rustling or something up on the uh, shoreline. And we look up at the shore and they're just sticking out from about where you see me now. In other words, from about the uh, mid chest up was the head and shoulders of what you would presume to be a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. He, he or she was um, mostly hairy except for the face. Uh, very large head compared to humans. Very wide shoulders compared to humans. The face itself was somewhere between, this is the only way I can say it, the, somewhere between human and ape-like in the sense that they had a very broad nose, kind of upturned nostrils like apes do. But the eyes, though, I thought were more human-like. any rate, so we stared at each other for maybe 10 seconds. Um, and then it turned around and rapidly ran away into the trees. And we lost sight of it immediately because, like I said, the brush was so thick. We could hear it running away. Um, and it certainly seemed to be on two feet, um, but lost track of it, um, or lost visual track of it, like almost immediately. Um, we, after it was gone, we're, you know, we're still sitting there in the boat, not knowing what to do. So we immediately went back to our um, cabin, which we were living in a cabin about a mile away or so from the, uh, the where we saw the signing, although on the lake, and went inside loaded all our guns because we didn't know what to, we were a little bit scared um, and didn't know what to do about it. Didn't know, should we tell somebody this? And what are we going to tell them if we do tell them this? And we ended up not, not, not telling anybody for many years, actually, you know, and from there, like I said, I was already in college. I went to medical school, to residency, to fellowship. We are very busy. And I just kind of put it out of my mind and then just kind of started thinking about it again 
just in the last few years, you know, as I was approaching retirement and, I, you know, kind of uh, you think about things you did in the past and start to reminisce and think, well, what could I, you know, how could I deal with this? So that's kind of how it came up. I never saw anything again after that. Nar did my, my buddy. He actually is deceased now. Um, we never saw any footprints. We never smelled anything. It was just the visual sighting. No vocalizations that, that we could tell, at least. You know, we would hear howls around the uh, cabin at night. But, you know, it could be coyotes. It could be anything. So that was the only thing specifically that I would uh, say I'm sure was something that uh, shouldn't have been there according to regular biology. Well, yeah, that's exactly uh, what I was going to say with your background and your, your studies. You're looking at something that shouldn't exist in our environment. I imagine that was something really hard to consume. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's partly why, you know, we didn't want to say anything about it. But because if you do say something about it, um, you know, some people are going to look at you crossways and particularly in a profession, it, it might be damaging. It, it could well be, you know, damaging to your professional career. So, um, you know, I just chose to be quiet about it. Did you ever go back to that location? Yeah. You know, like I said, we continued to work there through that summer. Uh, so we would take the boat out and go up and down the entire length of the lake almost every day. Never saw anything else again. Never saw any any evidence of anything. I imagine you were always looking, though, even nope. even as time went by, every time you went out into the forest, you knew what was there. You were all, always. Oh, yeah. No, we were on edge, you know, all the time when we would go out. Um, and, and usually we took one of the guns with us. Well, going into a profession like you did, you held it in all those years. Did your friend ever talk to you about it or is it just something you guys left there? You know, we pretty much left it there. We split up after college. He went to the West Coast. I went to New Orleans. We would talk by phone occasionally. We saw him once or twice in, you know, 25 years before he died. So while we were friendly, we never really talked about that. So all those years passed and now you're getting to the point where you're retiring. Is it something you knew you were going to do? Did you know you would go back into the, the, like the crypto field and try to find the answers to that? Hmm. Did I know that? You know, I have to say no, not until, like I said, maybe at most five years ago. I, I really didn't think about it. And I don't know that I actively tried not to think about it, but just didn't come up, um, you know, in my regular work. Plus, you know, we had a family. We had four kids, uh, got a grandson now. Um, so it just didn't come up, really. So now that we are in a little bit different place in our lives, now it seems more reasonable to look into it. But yeah, you know, during my career, not really. You know, I just, it just wasn't an issue. Well, Louisiana to me would be a prime area, but also Alabama and Arkansas are just seem to be hot spots. With your background and your, and what you recall seeing from memory, memory, do you think it's, um, more like a tribal or a person, or do you think it's more like an ape or what, what do you think it is? Yeah, I do definitely believe it's a flesh and blood animal of some sort. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's human. I think it is something like an, like a primate, like an ape. Mm -hmm. Um, it, uh, I think specifically the one we saw probably was just migrating because there really haven't been that many reports from that. This is in Eastern Arkansas, you know, just adjacent to the Mississippi river. Most of the reports in Arkansas are from Western and Northern Arkansas in the Ozarks. Well, this was in right along the river in the Mississippi Delta. And there are not many reports from there. I, I've always wondered if perhaps this creature was just passing through in a sense, maybe traveling down the dense undergrowth that lines the Mississippi River in so many places to get to wherever he was going. Um, and we just happened to surprise him there. We just lucked up on it. Pure chance that, that we uh, happened to see it at that time. I think we surprised each other. Um, so I think it was an animal. 
uh, believe that it was an animal um, and that it, probably they are social to some degree, but like a lot of animals, um, perhaps the males uh, break off when they start to mature and try to go other places. Um, and, you know, that that's kind of my take on it. When you're looking at something that massive and, and I'm picking your brain because of your training because you don't get the opportunity to do that a lot. When you're looking at something that massive, could could they survive on vegetation and fruits alone? Because looking at muscle mass, but right. That's I'm, that's I'm, one of the big questions that that a lot of people discussed. How are how many of these creatures could survive in a specific environment? In this, the environment I saw mine in, there are there is still is a fair amount of wildlife in the form of deer and raccoons and various even alligators occasionally now, um, as well as lots of plant life. So could it uh, support something like that? Yeah, probably so. Um, would it support a whole colony of them? I think probably not because there's not enough room there. You know, if you go just across the river, there's the city of Memphis, which is, you know, completely over, overbuilt, um, fields and other small towns on the other side of it. So, um, I, I think there probably is there. Uh, and I think generally the bigger are more wide open or more undeveloped areas like the Ozarks, like the Pacific Northwest and other places mm -hmm. uh, could potentially support, you know, a colony potentially of them. Okay. So if you're drinking the fresh water and the water from the rivers and you're at a, you know, the Mississippi river, I mean, there's, there's, you know, contamination in those places. So wouldn't they be subject to cancer? And I'm just, I'm asking these questions because of your field, because I, I mean, some people may be like, you know, Miss V, you're just kind of out of line. But to me, I, I think about that. I think about tooth decay and getting an infection that could kill them. Uh, you know, I mean. I no, I think that's real. I think that's realistic to think they could. Um, you know, most cancers in humans occur as they get older. So my, most animals in the wild don't live long enough to get cancer because they die of something else. Um, so is it possible that a, or, or let me back up. We know that apes that are kept in captivity can get cancers. There's actually a number of different kinds of, um, lymphomas that apes can get. So could potentially a Sasquatch or Bigfoot creature develop a cancer? I think that, yeah, that's, that's probably possible. So the same things that, um, same contaminants like pesticides pesticides and stuff that that would affect this probably would affect them because they're drinking straight out the river but what answers are you looking for what why i mean you've come into the field and you're you're looking for answers what kind of answers are you looking for what where is your curiosity taking you in this field i really think we have to have concrete evidence and by that i mean we got to have a body I know there are a lot of people who think we shouldn't, you know, shoot them or try to kill them. I think it's the only way that you, we're going to get the scientific world to take it seriously. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, if we get a body, then it can be protected, but they're not going to be protected without a body. So development will continue to occur in the places where we have sightings. Um, so I think that's, that's an absolute until we get a body um, you know, it, it's all in the realm of mythology as far as most of the public is, is concerned, you know, and I, I'm actually friends with, with Jeff Meldrum, who you may have heard of is a, a very active researcher. He's actually a, uh, uh, professor at Idaho state. And I've been up to his lab a couple of times and talked to him by phone many times. And, and he and I, I think agree on that. You, we've got to have concrete evidence to, really move forward in the field. If we have a body, then we can start to research those things like 
you know, cancers. Do cancers occur or, in, or other physiologic things that potentially occur? They're just their reproduction. You know, we really have no idea how that, I mean, we assume it's something that's similar to what apes do, but we don't know for sure. We can learn about why they might migrate. You know, is it purely in search of food? Is it, um, you know, is a young adult male goes in search of a new uh, mate, perhaps? Uh, see, we, we're not going to be able to study those things until we have a body. Okay, so let me ask you this. You're in the medical field, so you know about the HeLa cells or HeLa cells and how the history of that. Yeah. What do you think if we had a body? Let's just for the sake of people, you know, not sending me death threats, just say we come across a body that was already dead. Sure. What do, you, what do you think we could find out through just a blood sample about creatures? I mean, I, we know about the hair samples, but if we could get a, a blood sample, what kind of information would be out there for us to find out? You could sequence the DNA. That, that's by far and away the most important part. If you have DNA that you could say, oh, yes, this DNA came out of that body without question, then we could learn lots of things, uh, you know, about not just heredity, but about physiology, about cancer, about a lot of other things. Um, but it, that's what it's going to take is the confirmation that you got the DNA from a real body of a creature that's not otherwise known to science. I get, you know, when I look back and I, I don't have the answers, I don't, and I don't consider myself a researcher. I've had experiences, but I've never, you know, looked at one. Uh, what I, I was telling you earlier, what I saw was the, you know, the canine creature. But, you know, when we look at something that massive with that kind of muscle mass, and as they're, they're built, most of them are built so big. Um, some of them are slender and athletic type and just they almost look like a, a professional athlete. Not all of them are the patty type. But I'm looking at them, then I'm looking at them in cold weather environments. You have places that are as, are as extreme as, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota in the winter or you know, you know, Wisconsin or these places that get, get really cold. And my question is, they're mostly muscular. They're mostly um, athletic. How do they, how would you think would, in your professional opinion, or just a guess, and you don't have to be right, how could they live in that environment and not get frostbite and not, you know, people say, well, they tunnel under and would hibernate, but you don't have the fat cells to do that. So I, I'm just curious what your take would be. Well, you know, if you assume that there's something like humans and apes mm -hmm. and other primates, all, all of those creatures, humans in particular, have the ability to self-regulate their temperatures. So humans and apes potentially could live in almost any temperature climate. And they do. You know, you can mm -hmm. find monkeys in on mountaintops, uh, are in jungles, are in, you know, rainforests. That's right. And humans can do the same thing. We can live almost anywhere. Uh, so I don't think it's a stretch to think um, this creature could do the same thing. You know, if you can body, if you can regulate your temperature, you get too hot, you figure out ways to turn your temperature down. For humans, that's sweating, basically. And the evaporation of their sweat cools you off. Why not the, could the uh, Bigfoot do something similar to that? I would think they'd also be prone to overheating too. But I've also seen things just in my personal ex experience out in the swamps, in North Carolina, that would indicate they roll in mud and that would be a way to cool down and to get insects off of them. But that's something else that I think about. Are they prone to, you know, tick-borne diseases? And, and like you said, it goes back to you have to have a body and to, to figure out what's going on with them. So, uh, there's so many questions until we have a body, but I do believe the one person that ever found a body, I don't think they uh, would have a very easy life. I think they, you know, would be. Um, oh, absolutely. Now when the body, when and if a body is found, what I would tell that person, whoever it is, um, go to the news media first, like go to your local TV station, newspaper, whatever it might be, 
with the body in hand. Don't go to the government first. Go to the news and let them put it on the air. Let them publicize it before anything else happens. Um, and th then there's absolute documentation that can't go away, basically. In this day and age, once you publish anything online, it's there forever. And it, it really can't go away. So, um, you know, rather than take a chance that somebody wants to somehow keep it quiet for who knows what reason, I, I don't know, really. But, I you know, they, it could be that there are people out there, there are government officials out there that want to keep it quiet for who knows what reason. So publicize it first would be my suggestion. So when you're looking at, you know, you're going out there now, you're getting back interested, you know, in the Bigfoot community and you're meeting a lot of great people and you have met some really great people. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca and Mark, absolutely wonderful people and um, woodwalkers and um, actually um, uh, Mark and Becca, Cedar Creek Bottom farms and homestead is their youtube channel i finally got it right and that those are some really good people now being in alabama your your chances of seeing one or having activity is really great do you plan to get a team up or is it something are you just going to camp solo or, or what is your 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 plans from here on out you know so far i've just gone with other people who are more experienced than i am <laughs> Um, and you still have to try. I mean, we're right on the beach. It's, you know, it's very developed. Um, you know, so I would have to travel a ways. It takes about four hours or so for me to get to like, for example, the, where the uh, Talladega meet and greet was a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's probably the closest area to me now that has, you know, a reasonable expectation uh, of having, you know, a sighting. Um, do I have a plan specifically? You know, not really. I guess I, what I would say is, I, you know, I, and I've said this before, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm not an active uh, hunter. I am a active um, observer of it at this point. Because I'm not really sure what I would do, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I keep, I'm learning. I'm a neophyte in this. So for the time being, I'm just going to keep seeing what other people are doing and hopefully go along for the ride as, as best I can. So dealing with all the people that you've dealt with, the most time you, that you've dealt with people in your career has been under, been under bad circumstances. So when imagine someone, you know, out there that has seen a Bigfoot like you, you, I mean, a lot of people would go in denial and then they'd start second guessing their, what they saw. And then when they do come out, they get ridiculed for it. And then you have someone with your background and, and, you know, and your intelligence that, I mean, you finally one day just said, you know what, I'm retired. This is my story. But you did report your story. And you yeah. spoke with you spoke with a, a BFRO investigator about it. Was How was that experience? Because I've heard good things and bad things about reporting. You know, it seemed to be fine to me. And that was probably the first thing I did when I decided, okay, I'm going to start thinking about this. I kind of stumbled upon the BFR website, just mm -hmm. again, by chance almost. Uh, so, I, and I saw they had reports from all over. I thought, oh, okay, I could, I could potentially do this. And that was maybe 10 years ago, maybe when I did that, maybe less. Um, so I put my report in and a representative from the BFRO did contact me. And we talked by phone a couple of times, actually, maybe for an hour each time. He was very pleasant, um, seemed very, you know, uh, knowledgeable, very respectful, um, you know, didn't seem, you know, uh, too much in the the woo part of it, um, which I think is a good thing. Not that I'm belittling anybody who, who feels mm -hmm. that way, um, but I think you got to start with, with the physical stuff before you can get to the other stuff. So I, I, I had a good experience with it. And I've had a few people contact me since that report went up, uh, you know, after having read it online, they, you know, get in contact with me through that. So it was a good experience for me. That's all I can say. Well, when you go back and you look at the mapping project and other, are you amazed at how many people have had sightings? 
Oh, absolutely. You know, I think there's been an increase in the number of people who will, I guess, admit to sightings in the last, you know, whatever, 10 years or so, which I, is interesting. You know, why exactly is that? Maybe it's purely a function of social media. In other words, you can you can publish things about yourself and, and perhaps worry less about ridicule maybe than you could have in the past. Perhaps that's it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I've been in, fascinated by the number of people and the variety of both the stories and the uh, settings that those stories are in. When you said you're looking at the facial features of it, um, I, I hear people talk about the incredible scent, the O factors they have. When you were looking at the face of this creature, and as you say, um, it's like a primate to you. And, and honestly, if people don't agree with that, they can go with their research and their first impressions taken, but your first impression and what you've seen you relate it to a primate. So we're going to go with that. When you're looking at it and you said it had human like features and the nose kind of flared up, was the way it was designed, was there any indicators there that it would have uh, the O factors that would be more keen than what ours would be that there's, they could pick up on a person's scent or it would have an incredible oh i don't know how to say it, an incredible o factor um you know not that i could tell uh i think it was as surprised as we were to see us there you know we were quiet but then we were you know just uh with the trolling motor uh not making any noise um i you know I, we might have been upwind from it at the time so it couldn't potentially smell us couldn't hear us couldn't see us until we got right in front of him um so and not that I could tell the other, the flip side of that is we did not smell anything. You know, many people have reported a, a very pungent odor associated with it. We didn't smell it. You know, I, I wonder if that odor is something that they can turn on and off, you know, like um, male apes of various sorts can release, uh, you know, sort of a, a pungent odor like thing. And we don't know exactly why they do it. Maybe it's somehow communicating. We don't know. But at any rate, we, I, we did not smell anything like that. So, um, you know, I can't ascribe any specific characteristics to it other than, like I said, that the visual sighting. The nose particularly was more, like I said, more ape-like. It was flattened with the upturned nostrils like an ape would be. But the eyes, I thought, were more human-like. They were, they were not as deep set as an apes typically are. It did not have the big brow ridge. Um, yeah. like, right, like apes do. The mouth, I thought, was more human-like, and it was small. Uh, you know, it didn't have the big pliable lips like apes do. Um, so, like I said, it, it, to my way of thinking, it was somehow looked, at least, in between a ape and human. So, was this one built like a patty type, or was this one like the slender athletic yeah, you know, we only saw it, like I said, from like mid chest up. So I can't say, for example, how tall it was or what its legs looked like or anything. Mm -hmm. Shoulders are very broad. If I had to guess, I would say it was more the patty type. So, I mean, it looked at you and then it was like, oh, crap, you know, and I guess they don't know their own size, do they? Oh, right. Exactly. I think they were or that creature was just as surprised or startled as, as we were. You know, in fact, I'll give you a little more background about it. So that summer, the summer of 1980 in, in that area was like the hottest on record for many, many years. It had gotten over 100 degrees for like 25 days in a row with no rain. And I wonder if the creature was coming down to the lake, like I said, maybe to cool off um, because it, it was so hot you know, each day. And was you know trying to find a, a water source where it could you know maybe jump in and swim, maybe at least get a drink. Who knows what? And did not anticipate in that saying that there would be any humans out there because usually there's not. Usually the that part of the lake was not uh, visited by uh, any of our swimmers. Or anything that was probably a mile away from our where our swimming area was. So the, usually that part of the lake was. Um, completely uh, 
I won't say abandoned, but completely non molested by humans to speak. So we, I, I think we really caught it by surprise. I think that's really fascinating. And it's a shame you couldn't watch it a little bit longer before it saw you because there's so much information you could just, it's like, it's like watching a wild animal in the zoo. You're never, you, you don't get the, the detail that you're going to get in a captured environment as you would in the wild. And to think that you probably never have that opportunity again. Right. That, I mean, that was, it was either a blessing or a curse to you. So I, I just find that really, a, really fascinating. What do you think? Um, just, and I know you're, you're in this, you, you know, you're the type of person you're going to dig into a subject and look at things. And you did say you're, I'm friends with Dr. Jeff Melbourne. He was actually on my show and he, I think his thesis in college was on a, uh, like a baboon in, from Africa. And he was talking about their feet and the way their, their, the tracks they leave and everything. Yep. Are, are you one of those people that would go out and make casts? Or are you one of those people that you would just observe it and, and leave it uncontaminated and just take in what, what you're seeing and then leave it as is. You know, I've never really had the opportunity to do that in that I, I can't say that I've ever really ever seen a, a footprint, but you're, you're right. Uh, Jeff Meldrum's research area was bipedal locomotion in primates. Uh, so how primates walk basically on, uh, on two feet and uh, the difference is that there may be between that and walking on four feet. So he, he, probably is the world's expert on that particular subject. I would probably, given the opportunity, try to cast a print. Now, I, I've never done it before, so I'm not sure technically that, that I would be good at it. Uh, but I, I would like to think that I, that I would try if I found one that was castable. Okay, let me go here with you. If you could build a team of world-class experts what kind of people would you have on your team and what would their specialties be? Hmm. You know, I think uh, if you picked out a specific area, which I think that's what you'd have to do first, then you would at least have one person who is very familiar with the local area. In other words, someone who would be it a hunter or a, a hiker or somebody who know the area very well. Secondly, I think you'd have to have somebody who say like Jeff Meldrum, who was a grounded, presumably scientific, uh, or took a scientific approach to the issue, um, then perhaps take somebody who is more of a, you know, I won't say an amateur, but, but a non-professional uh, Sasquatch Bigfoot hunter, you know, if you want to call it that. So I don't think it would be any more than three or four people. Um, you know, if you get much bigger than that, you start to wonder, you know, you would scare off any animals that would be, you know, wherever you were. Um, so I think you need knowledge of the, the, the local area, knowledge of the biology of local area. And that's what somebody like Jeff Meldrum could give you. And then knowledge of what we think the, our, our knowledge of our information that we currently have on Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Two questions for you. First, you're friends with uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. What's the one thing you learned from him that you didn't think that kind of took you off guard about the subject? Two, what do you, with your background, have to offer the community with your work? Two questions. You know, one thing that, that I, I did learn from Dr. Meldrum uh, was how much his career suffered from this. He was denied tenure many times. He has it now, but it much later in his career than he would have gotten it had he had some other research interest. And I, while I kind of suspected that was the case before, uh, he said, absolutely, it was. Um, so and so I'm more, all right, I believe it now. So that may be one of the things that, that I learned from him. Uh, I learned some of the specifics about the... Uh, presumed foot itself, like the uh, um, uh, the bipedal locomotion, that is, there's a uh, uh, 
spot in the middle of the presumed middle of the Bigfoot foot where it flexes that humans don't have. And that's probably because their foot uh, are the bones in their foot, which are similar to ours, but they're placed in a little bit different spots so that they can flex the uh, tarsals where we cannot, we, you know, humans feet, human feet are not made for that. We're probably more adept and accommodated to bipedal walking and running than they are. They're a little more, still a little less uh, adept at walking on two feet and pr probably they're more adept at, at walking on four feet at times or climbing trees, who knows what. Um, so I, I did learn those things. Um, you know, would I, would, what would I, yeah, I think it was, what, what would I offer to, to a community in Bigfoot? I would like to think I would offer a, a objective, um, unbiased mind and opinion. So I could look at, uh, data, information, whatever it might be, and be able to give a, a honest and um, reasonable assessment of it from my point of view. That you kind of um, refreshing my memory. Uh, one of the reasons I reached out for you is the other night when I was speaking with Greg, he was talking about the, the uh, creature that was going up the mountain and he said it was weird the way it dug its foot into it's almost like it had a bend in the top of the foot and it dug into the mountain and you called it right off in the, the comments uh, about the foot can you go into that what you were trying you just explained that and that that is why you kind of confirmed what he was saying um that based on the information that dr melbourne brought from you what he was describing would be perfectly logical with what he was seeing when the creature was going up the hill. The sure. You know, that's the presumption that, that the Sasquatch has what they call a mid tarsal break. And that's that spot in the middle of the foot where the foot can flex. So if the foot can flex, then it makes sense that they could use that foot, not just to walk, but also in a way to kind of grasp, uh, you know, there's to dig their toes in kind of like if you had spikes on, on, on a boots so that you walk on ice or something like that. This is a way of grasping uh, through snow to stabilize yourself and give you a little more stability in trying to climb up a hill, for example. So that, I mean, you pretty much just confirmed everything that he was saying about it. And, and I think that's really important because people talk about, the, how they get down like a spider crawl and what's your opinion on that based on their anatomy or what you're learning from Dr. Melvin? Right. So it's just like I was saying before the, that foot, if you mm -hmm. use that, that theory about the feet mm -hmm. that they have a mid tarsal break, then they're not as well adapted to walking on two feet as we are, but they may well be better adapted to walking on four feet. So maybe at times when they uh, feel more, you know, they have to go faster, or they have to, they're hiding or whatever it is. They drop down to four feet, four limbs, uh, and move that way in a way that, that humans can't do that. You know, if we drop down to four feet, we can't move as fast nice. as we can on two feet. But that maybe that's not the case for them because of the structure of their, their feet and hands. You know, what if they actually move around more on four feet and when they come or catch the scent of a a person they stand up almost like a wild animal do would to show dominance and that to make themselves come across bigger i don't know uh, there'll be someone in the just for observation that, you know like bears will stand up on their rear feet just to observe or to smell you know maybe that's that's part of what it is they sense something is there they stand up on two feet to get a little higher perspective on it you know maybe that's it too what do you think of the calm heads some of them have the calm heads. It was the one that you saw had the calm head or did it have Not a... really. It was more or almost uh, flat or round, around, not flat. But I, I did not see the the sagittal crest is what they call it, um, so which like apes frequently have. And the, the point of the sagittal crest in apes is it allows the jaw muscles, which are very big in apes, to attach to the crest, to the bony crest, 
so that they have great jaw power, much more than humans do. Human jaw muscles just attach to the side of the head and you don't have to, because they're just not that big in comparison to theirs. So that's the idea behind a sagittal crest, you know, and maybe it's, it's like any other creature. There's some variation um, in what they look like. Some of them have a sagittal crest, some of them have less so or none at all. And if I'm not mistaken, you said the one you saw was black. Yes. The hair was dark brown to black. The, you could see the uh, face or the skin of the face. That was the only area that really wasn't hairy that I could see. Um, and that was you know, I, dark, certainly. You know, I, I couldn't say it was black as in an African-American. It was more. Skin, like the sun. Yeah, more gray and kind of weathered. Like an older one? Yeah. I, you know, and whether that really was an older one, I don't know. Um, maybe just exposure, being outside all the time, you know, that could make something look older. Do you plan on going out with Dr. Jeff Meldrum? You know, Jeff is, has not been going out in the field a whole lot lately. Although I think I heard just recently he was going to do something new. He had had a number of health problems in the last few years and it almost quit going out in the field. Um, you know, I keep up with him every so often. I'd love to do something if he has, you know, he gets sponsors to sponsor. And so it's not, it's not like you could just pack up and go with him. He would have to have approval from whoever his sponsors are and that sort of thing. So yeah, I'd love to, I, I doubt that that uh, will materialize, but yeah, I'd love to. You know, the one thing I realized about him, um, uh, when I was, um, and I don't interview people, I just chat with them, but you know, with your background, I'm just throwing some some wacky questions at you. And you're really just taking them and rolling with them. You're a good sport. Um, but, you know, I have to, you know, talking to me, you have to talk to me like I'm a three-year-old because a lot of people go into, you know, the Bigfoot arena and people assume they know everything and, they're, and they start talking about the mid-tarsal break. And, and a lot of people are just like, they just nod their heads and go on with it because they don't understand it. Um, but when I was talking to him, he was talking about, you know, his childhood and how he grew up and, you know, he was, uh, I think a scout Eagle, or I can't remember what the Mormons call it. And he had a really good, I mean, he took us back to his childhood and you, we were living it through him. So it's not just like one day he woke up and decided he liked the outdoors. He, his life consisted of being outdoors, almost like you, you were fishing and, you know, you spent a lot of time outdoors and, but you never, when you look back now, do, do you feel like that was the first time you were around things or do you feel like, you know, as a child growing up or even as a young adult that there was things you saw that now make sense that could have been um, Bigfoot or Sasquatch related? You know, I, I, I can't really say that I have or that I did. I've tried to be very circumspect about that sort of thing. There's always things you hear or see that you can't explain or that you don't know why they are the way they are. And in medicine, that's for sure. There are many things we don't know why they happen. Uh, but can you attribute them to something that's potentially paranormal? I try not to do that. I try not to explain a mystery with another mystery uh, because you're not getting, you're going in circles at that point. Um, you know, one thing interesting, you talk about Jeff Meldrum, he and I are about the same age and um, he could remember as could I seeing in the movie theater in 1968, I believe it was the original Patterson Gimlin film. They actually made a, a you know, a theatrical release that featured uh, you know, the, the film piece of, Patty, uh, and made it into a full length film and it came out in the theaters and I could remember seeing it too. I was probably 10 years old as was he and never forgot it basically. And we both, we kind of laughed because we both, uh, probably got more or less our first taste of Bigfoot or Sasquatch through that. Yeah. And it's kind of amazing cause you know, fast forward a couple of years there, you are looking at one. Absolutely. And I wouldn't have anticipated that. Now that seeing the Patterson film help you digest what you're looking at. 
Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I remember when I was little, you didn't, you know, you just, it was, you were in awe of it basically. And the more I've watched and the more I've seen people trying to analyze it, I, I came to the conclusion, I think Dr. Meldrum would agree with this. The Patterson film is either the greatest hoax of all time or it's real. Uh, I tend to lean towards it being real, but I won't swear. I You can't, you can't prove it beyond it. Uh, you know, 100% prove it. Um, so therefore, that made our, when I had my encounter sighting with it, it allowed me to believe, yes, this could be a real thing. If you could pick, pick anywhere in the United States to start a uh, research at, where would it be? What state would it be? And why? Hmm. You know, hmm. honestly, Probably. Yeah, that, that's a tough question. You know, there have been sightings almost every state in, you know, in, in pieces, like you say, in Louisiana and Alabama, too. Um, but if, I think if I had to pick out the one I think would be most likely, um, I'd probably pick Northern California, where the original Patty was. I've been there several times, been to Northern California several times. And that is it's wide open. There is lots and lots of space out there that is heavily forested that has very little population it's dominated by several national forests um lots of wildlife so you would think it would support uh you know a large primate like that um so i i would think that would be as good as any a few more questions and i'll let you go back to your to your family um a just sure as I opened my mouth, it went through, it went right out my brain. Um, California is a really good place. I think, I think it'd be um, an outstanding place to start. I think I would prefer the swamps, the, like the bows of Louisiana or where, you know, I, I go out just, just the swamps of North Carolina. It, it's just something about that feel. And, but as you're going out there and you're making your way out into the community and you're getting to know people and you're starting to learn a little, I, I imagine you're the type of person you're very selective about the information you take in. What do you think of the vocals, the, the howls, that, the ones that sound like the owls? What, what do you think um, about those? Do you think yeah, uh, this is one of those things I, I tend to be more conservative about than a lot of people. The mm -hmm. howls in particular, boy, coyotes can make a lot of different sounds, as can a number of other, you know, wow, creatures. And, okay. you know, in fact, there were people at the meet and greet, and I, I won't bring up any names because I don't want to embarrass anybody, who we I, and I heard howls and they swore it. That's a Bigfoot. I don't know. I don't know, you know, and I, I, of course I didn't press them on that. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, just, I would not have called it that. I would have said, Oh, that's, that's easily explainable as something else. Now the one exception to that, that uh, to the vocal uh, sample is the so-called Sierra sounds. And I don't know if you ever heard that, but it's, it's, like it's not really, yeah. yeah, it's not really a howl. It's more like, um, almost like talking or communication somehow. It's very different from anything else, um, you know, that's out there. And if, if again, either that's real or it's the one of the greatest hoaxes of all time. I, um, the, the more I talk to you now, I had asked you before the show that if, if you ever want to come on for like a round table and I, I'm kind of getting the feel of now who would be, you know, perfect person to pair you up with there's actually a, a, a gentleman out there that that studies the language the mumbling and um that and but also there's another gentleman that had a sighting that um that's really into sometimes i i, I pair people up that's like-minded and sometimes i pair people up that are totally opposite just just to have a conversation um now I've had you almost an hour. If there's, is there anything in closing that you would like to put out there about your experience or about 
your direction you're going or just about the community in general? You know, it's been a pleasure, as, as you said before, the, to meet people in the community because they've been nothing but nice and pleasant to me. Um, so I've met people who have been, who have become friends, uh, which I might not have expected, you know, going into it. Uh, so th that it's been a, a very pleasant or a good experience from that point. So I would not discourage anybody who is interested in it from, from making the effort. In other words, go ahead and approach, uh, you know, whatever group you want to approach, because it's likely they're going to be good people and they'll be friendly and they'll accept you, you know, uh, unquestionably. Last question. What kind of guitar is that? Is that a, a, a Fender, a Tele? It's a Gretsch, actually. I just got that about a year ago uh, from a place called Casino Guitars. Actually, in North Carolina, not probably not. It's in uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina. They're very nice guys. Okay. Uh, and I'll give them a little shout out. They'll they'll get a laugh out of that. Um, oh yeah, but it's it's cool. It's it's really nice. The color is great. It plays great. Sounds great. Um, so it's one of my favorites. The color of Southern Pines is green. What do you play? Uh, I play. You know, honestly, mostly I play bass guitar, but I I have guitars also. Plus, I play keyboards occasionally and various other things. So a little of everything. Jazz, rock and roll, blues. You know, mostly uh, I would say blues, blues-based rock, I, but I've done country, I've done R&B. Uh, again, I won't say I'm a professional, but I'm kind of a, a jack of all trades in that sense. I will not put you on the spot and ask you to play a tune, but if you ever come back, be prepared, sir. Be prepared. Oh, they told me at the meet and greet next time uh, they want me to bring my guitar. Well, it's right behind you. Just throw out a tune right quick. I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days. All right, sir. I know when to stop while I'm ahead. Okay. At the end of each show, is there anyone you would like to give a shout out to? It can be your wife, anyone in your family, someone in the Bigfoot community. I always give uh, at the end of the show, people a moment to pay tribute to anyone. Is there anyone you'd like to pay tribute to? No, absolutely. I would give uh, or give a shout out to my wife who puts up with me, you know, and my sometimes presumed eccentricities uh, without, you know, question, without doubt. So here's to her. Well, Dr. Robinson, I have enjoyed the chat and um, I look forward to having you back on the show for a wild card chat. And thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you as well. I, I enjoyed it also. And um, come back anytime. Okay.